Okay, so this is part two of my kind of FSCV lecture where I'm actually going to talk about FSCV. The last time we had to cover conventional or slower scan rate CV in order to be able to uh, understand FSCV. So this time we can go right into FSCV. So with conventional CV, I told you your thing would look like that. Um, let me see if I can draw them on the same scale. We almost never do this. Uh, so if I was to draw some axis again, this is current versus voltage axis. If I do slow scan, my signal looks something like this uh, for dopamine. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go out and do something like that. For FSCV, and again, don't worry about the peak height here. Uh, I'm, I'm worried more about peak shape. For FSCV, though, we tend to scan from minus 0.4 volts all the way up to 1.3 volts and back. So if I were to do, show you an FSCV trace, it looks something like this. So it looks completely different <laughs> than the slow scan. I wanted to put them on the same axes so we would have some idea of how wildly different uh, these two things look. Uh, and again, the only difference, really difference here is, as I said, the, the black line, the slow scan, would be done at 100 millivolts per second, whereas our fast scan should be done at like 100 to 1,000 volts per second. So we've got this really funky looking FSCV um, uh, cyclic voltammogram. And again, if you understand conventional cyclic voltammetry, you're like, wow, that looks really different. Uh, and so this is our audience participation part of the you know, lecture. I want you to just point out, what are some of the differences that you see between this black CV and the red one? Again, don't, don't tell me too much about peak height right now. Uh, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we're not worried about actual magnitude, but just differences in shape. What do you see? Potential way shifted. The potentials are way shifted. All right. All right, so one, the potentials are way shifted, right? Yeah, they're not anywhere near where they were the last time. Uh, so the, the, you know, the potential of this peak is shifted way out. Good. Somebody else. No dark shape. No duck shape. No duck shape, yes. We lost our duck shape, so we have no duck bill, so to speak, um, uh, where uh, they, we've lost kind of that duck shape. Instead, we have a pretty symmetrical looking peak uh, that, that looks a lot different. Delta EP is very different. Yeah, so I'm going to put that kind of back with this one, that the delta E peak is very different, right, and it's large, right, so it's nowhere near that 59 over n millivolts, I can assure you, uh, uh, that we saw um, before. Um, anything else? Well, reduction peak is way smaller than Yeah, and, and that's, I told you I'm worried about magnitude too much, and then I realized that that might have been, I do actually want to talk about that. Uh, so again, this is probably somebody who knows the, or they're doing the reduction peak is smaller. Okay, so, those are actually, congratulations, the three things I want to talk about. But I can't talk about those quite yet. <laughs> um, there's a prelude uh, to me being able to talk about that. And that is that this is not the actual data that we collect. Uh, and so we must first talk about background currents. Um, so we will get back to those three peaks, though, uh, those three kind of things. Okay. So if that was true, again, you always have to ask yourself, why do people go slow, right? Why is fast scan the kind of newer invented technique, although it was invented in the 80s, it's not super new now, um, but why do people do that to begin with, right? You know, it looks great, maybe you should go, everyone should go fast. Why did they not start out doing that? And the answer has to do with something that we call background charging current. Okay, so for um, any electrode that you have, 
uh, an electrode that's in solution that's surrounded by ions, and most of the time we put our thing in some sort of salt buffer, um, right? So those ions are salt, like NaCl, right? If I apply a voltage to my electrode, I'm going to apply positive voltage here. You can imagine that, well, if I'm a positively charged ion, I don't want to be near the positively charged electrode, right? If I'm a negatively charged ion, ooh, I'm attracted to it, right? And so those ions move around in, in, in uh, the solution, and we get what's called a charging current. And it's, again, due to ions moving. If we wait long enough, they'll rearrange into something called a double layer, and then we won't get any more current. But unfortunately, we can't do that in cyclical temperature. We can't wait it out. There are other techniques that wait it out. We're not waiting it out here, so we get a charging current. And for FSCV in particular, um, the charging current has a, has a uh, consistent shape, and it looks like this. Um, uh, if you've looked at it again, all my axes are still irises. Um, uh, but I should label them properly. Um, uh, so I versus B, so we get a charging current. And the problem with FSCV is that if I were to actually put a like label on this, <laughs> it would be something in like the hundreds of nanoamps range. So it's a large, and I didn't label my other axes, but if I had labeled that CV that I showed you before, I would have labeled the current in maybe 10 nanoamps. So you see we have a problem, right? My what we call Faradayic current might be on the range of something like 10 nanoamps, but my charging current is something like, you know, as I said, like 500 nanoamps, something like that. It varies by the electric, but I'm just trying to get a scale here. So this is why nobody did this for a long time, right? That would be crazy, right? How do you pick out your tiny signal? Because if we actually look at our signal, it looks something like this, you know, or whatever, like for dopamine, right? Like this is the one with dopamine, if we show this classic figure, and then that's without dopamine. And now you see, and that's like a best case scenario that you can actually pick it out. Sometimes you can even see it with your eye. Uh, so we've got this huge charging current. And you always have to be aware of it in FSCB, that we can't really get away from it. Um, so background current's just a fact of life. Um, and so we want to be able then to do something with it. And so the, the whole trick to getting FSCB to work was when somebody realized that, yes, I get this large current, but it's the same every time, basically, right? If I have my thing and it's in the same environment, the same brain or the same buffer, every time I'm going to get this huge back background. And so what I can do is I can do a subtraction. I can look when I don't have dopamine present, and then I can see what the background current was. And then I can put it in dopamine, and I can take it. And so we do what we call background subtraction. So background subtraction is what I showed you before, was a background subtracting CV. So I take, I take a CV, you know, I didn't draw the whole thing out. I'll draw the whole thing out. So the black one would be with dopamine, uh, something like that. So there's a, here's my you notice I put a little bit there. Um, so the black one would be with dopamine, and then the blue one would be without, and I do a subtraction and I get that CV that I showed you before that looks something like this. Um, so that's what we do, but you gotta be aware that there's a background because it, it does put a substantial limitation on FSCV that everybody in the field kind of knows, but you have to kind of appreciate from the beginning, and that is we're always looking at differences in neurotransmitters and not absolute basal levels. So there is a lot of people trying to do basal levels now, but this technique by itself won't do it because we're always doing a difference, always doing a difference. Here's my background, here's my other signal, and we're looking at difference. So we're great at looking at fast changes, we're bad at looking at um, basal levels. And when new people approach me with problems, like can you measure this, sometimes they're like, well I want to measure you know, how dopamine changes subtly over a 24 hour circadian rhythm. That is a bad application of FSCB. I can't do that well, right? You know, and I just have to admit, every technique has its pluses and minuses, that's not for me. So here, um, as I said, you have to think about uh, background subtraction. 
um, and we're always going to be doing uh, background subtraction. Okay, so with the background subtraction in mind, let's get on to those three points that we kind of outlined then. I will draw my FSCB thing up here, pure and unadulterated with any regular CVs. We don't need to talk about those anymore. Uh, you know, and we're gonna look at this shape. Uh, so the first thing we noticed, right, was that the peaks are kind of, I think the uh, scientific terminology was way shifted, um, right? Uh, they are not in the same pieces, places where they should be, uh, right? Uh, before they were like right here, and now they're like really far apart. And somebody said, yes, the delta E peak was different. In fact, if for delta E peak for dopamine, again, uh, if you measure it at your electrode, it's usually somewhere, depending on the type of electrode you have, between 650 and 800 millivolts. Again, we were like, order magnitude higher than the 30 that it should be, right? You know, it's not 30, it's like 800. Uh, they're not even close. So the question is, why isn't it close? Um, I want to point out, again, I'm not giving a full electrochemistry lecture today. I'm not thermodynamics and why dopamine has the oxidation potential it has. But I want to point out the molecule hasn't changed. And even the electrode probably hasn't really changed. We'd still do conventional CV at a carbon electrode. So that means that those things haven't changed. That the potential that we can do the oxidation at has not changed. And I want to just say that the, nothing about the molecule has changed. If we could oxidize it at 0 0.15 volts before, we can still do that now. Uh, so the problem isn't in the molecule. Just when I lay the molecule today, uh, the problem is in our technique. Um, and the, the big answer to this has to do with scan, scan rate, can I spell? Uh, um, and the fact is that the scan rate now is basically what I'm going to say outrunning electron transfer. So that means that um, I am scanning faster than electron transfer. And there's some theory here that we're not going to do completely. Schwinn tells me he's going to cover it in a few weeks. Um, uh, you know, he says I should be comparing to the square root of um, scan weight, which is probably correct. But we're not going to do actual numbers, but we're outrunning the electron transfer. So imagine, again, that you want to, you know, transfer something to somebody. And at, you can start at a given voltage, right? So let's just, again, mark on our, if we were going from minus 0 0.4 up to 1.3 volts and back, you know, if this is the E0 for dopamine, that means technically at this potential, right, anything above that, I can start to transfer an electron. The question is, where is the electron transfer going to actually show up on the CV? Uh, and so what happens is, if I'm going really slowly, creeping up here, right? When I get here to the magic potential where I can now do the electron transfer, the electron transfers, and it's not difficult to see uh, kind of what's happening. The, but with fast scan, I'm not creeping along really slowly waiting for someone to hand me that electron. I'm speeding on through. Uh, and as I speed on through, I can transfer the electron, but by the time the electron actually gets transferred, it looks like it occurred up there. Uh, right, there's a delay, uh, and the delay is just because I sped through the point where it could happen, uh, but by the time it actually happened, I was at a much further potential. So th this idea of voltage and time uh, uh, kind of comes into play. Yes, I'm changing voltage, but yes, there's a time component to it too. Uh, and so it turns out that um, where these peaks are are very much dependent on the scan rate that you go. Um, and so, I'm going to draw it down here. So if I go a little bit slower, like 100 volts per second, you know, and I get peaks that kind of look like this. But if I go, say, 400 volts per second, I'm kind of trying to normalize the peak heights. You'd actually get bigger peaks. I'm going to talk about that right this moment. And if I go 1,000 volts per second, my peaks shift even more out. So let me label those. Uh, you know, as I said, 100, 1,000, 
volts per second, and the middle one might be kind of our standard 400 volts per second. Um, so the peaks shift out with scan rate here. So there isn't one, that's why I was like, I can't tell you one delta E peak. It depends on what scan rate you chose. Uh, but they're gonna, pick, they're gonna shift out um, as we change scan rate. And so I think it's important to, um, to kind of recognize that if we were going really slow, like in slow scan, actually the peaks don't change because the electron transfer is quick compared to the scan rate. And if it's quick compared to the scan rate, Oh, I scanned 100 millivolts per second. Oh, now I'm scanning 75, or now I'm scanning 200 millivolts per second. It's still, electron transfer is much faster than there, and so the peaks shouldn't change. So you go read the textbook, it says the peaks don't change. Oh, but they do in FSCB, because the electron transfer now is slow compared to it. So that's why our peaks are so far shifted. It also leads to an interesting phenomenon, though, um, one that cracks me up if you think about the theory. You cannot pick the peak. So for dopamine, we often say this is about 0 0.6 volts, and this one is about zero, minus 0 0.2 volts. Uh, again, those are dependent on what scan rate, but for 400 volts per second, something like that. But what, what, what's interesting to me is that when people do single cell amperometry experiments, they often hold their electrode at 0 0.6 volts, because that's the oxidation potential for uh, dopamine. And you're like, no, it's not. Uh, you just picked that off of FSCV, which is way shifted from the oxidation potential. You know, you do amperometry, which is just holding out a voltage, unless you don't mean 0.3 volts is quite fine. Uh, you know, 0.2 volts might even be quite fine, right? You know, so you can't, don't pick voltages off of these. The voltages are just screwy. Uh, so now we're getting to your head that that must be the oxidation potential. <laughs> no, it's not. It's really screwed up, uh, quite frankly. Uh, things are like. The other thing that kind of comes into play with this, things are shifted. Again, that, that, um, that I want to get away from the idea of um, up is oxidation, down scan is reduction. We have some molecules that we like to look at in the Benton lab, uh, where we go from minus 0.4, uh, in this case we'll go all the way up to 1.45 volts and back down to minus 0.4. But again, what can happen is that the actual peak for the oxidation will show up here on the downward scan. Again, that doesn't make it a reduction. What happens is that, that if, you know, now I shift, I said before my E0 for dopamine was down here, but E0 for adenosine is up here, one of the molecules we like to look at. And so by the time we pass the E0 and, and actually, um, uh, follow that the peak actually shows up on the back scan. So we get these really funky looking CVs that uh, everybody, you know, would find weird to interpret if they weren't us, where you know you kind of go out and you actually see your peak come out kind of on the back scan. That would be the first CV for, for adenosine without the secondary peak. So it happened on the back scan, as I said, we're still scanning up. So again, back scan doesn't mean reduction in there, it's just the time. Uh, it took extra time, and so it shows up on the back scan, and it looks a little bit funky. Um, okay. 